In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is class 31 of our Orthodox Survival Course. Tonight, I'd like to finish going through the book Nihilism by Father Seraphim Rose. Chapter 4, Nihilism, the Nihilist Program, and Chapter 5, Beyond Nihilism. But actually, the ideas, in studying these two chapters, uh, one sees that the ideas in the Nihilist Program are more or less the same ideas that are repeated in Beyond Nihilism. And the, the fundamental idea here is that the goal of the nihilists was never just to end by destroying things. Right? They, they, there, there is this demonic spirit of destruction. They're reveling in, in their destruction. But they always had the plan, after destroying the old things, to implant their program, to create their new society. Right? Because you can't actually just destroy everything. You have to, people have to go on living. So what kind of order do you have in which to live? What kind of world are you going to create? What kind of people are you going to create? And we're going to see that their program is to make a new earth and a new man. So it's completely Luciferian. They're, they're aping God. They're pretending to be God. We're going to destroy what God made, and we're going to create a new earth. And, of course, the phrase, the new earth, is directly blasphemous because in the book of the Apocalypse, God says, Lo, I am making a new heaven and a new earth. So this is their false salvation, their false kingdom of heaven that they're going to build on earth. And remember, this echoes a theme we've had throughout our course, which is the trap of chiliasm. Remember the early heresy that Christ is going to come to earth and establish an earthly kingdom. And so all forms of earthly utopia ideologies could be called chiliasm in a way. And this is just another very demonic chiliasm. Ultimately, all chiliasm is demonic. But this is one that's especially, especially terrible. So in chapter 4, the author outlines the three points of the nihilist program. The destruction of the old order, making of a new earth, and making of a new man. So the destruction of the old order, we're very familiar with that. This is what we've been talking about since the, the whole age of revolution began. The destruction of the old Christian order in the Christian nations, whether the, the Orthodox nations in the East or the Protestant Catholic nations in the West, but the destruction of the Christian order. And then ultimately destruction of all traditional orders. As we were, we were quoting this Michael Ledeen, this neocon um, ideologue last week, saying they want to destroy all traditional societies, whether they're Muslim or Chinese or uh, Indian or Arabic, whatever, just go out to the world and just destroy everything and create and create their own uh, utopia, right? Their own unique, their their own unique, their unique. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you're one part. Antichrist. Yeah, one. Just make the world one because they're preparing the way of Antichrist, of course. And um, so we're very familiar with this destruction of the old order, and we know that the revolutionary dogmas called for violence. The more destruction, the better. They want to kill as many people as they could, destroy as much as they could, to get everything out of the way so they could build their new world. And really, Father Seraphim, or Eugene at that time, is writing in 62. It's only 17 years after the end of World War II. So in his mind, everyone of that generation, World War II was very real to them. Right? It, ju it had just happened, and they still remembered it very well. And they, they, and they knew that with World War II, the mission was basically accomplished, right? with all these revolutions and then two huge wars, these cataclysmic wars, um, that the old civilization was, was essentially destroyed, and that they could start building their new their new order on the on the ruins of the old um <clears throat> so that what's the making of this new earth this is the now we're, we're going to cycle back to two things we've met already which was liberalism and realism remember we said earlier when we started the book we said that even though father seraphim talks about four stages of nihilism the four stages don't just completely succeed each other the old ideas keep coming back and being recycled in each stage so pure destruction cannot build anything. So to build something, they have to go back to their earlier stages that proposed to have a positive program and then put, bring those ideas. Now that, now that the old order is out of the way, they can take those ideas that in the, in the 19th century were revolutionary, but now in the 1960s, when he's writing, they're now become the establishment. They become the establishment ideas. They're no longer revolutionary ideas believed by a few elites. They're the ideas that now the masses have accepted. So what are these ideas? The idea of liberalism is that you don't need God to build a beautiful utopia on earth. There's no such thing as original sin. Man is primarily good, and if, and man, if man decides he can just make progress, there'll be no more poverty, no more sickness, uh, ultimately no more death. You can figure out, science can figure out a way for you not to die, and you'll just have this beautiful world where everything is, is wonderful. Okay, that's fundamentally, that's the idea of liberalism, classic liber liberalism, that uh, we just tolerate everyone, and, and, we're, and we're all, all ideas are, we're free to express our ideas, and there's, and um, we're all just going to love each other and take care of each other. It's kind of Rousseau's vision. Remember old Rousseau from the 18th century, Rousseau's vision that man doesn't really have original sin, he just needs to express himself, 
and everyone needs to just accept each other and everything will be wonderful. Savage. Yeah. The, yeah, the, the bon sauvage, yes. <laughs> Um, but 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 concomitantly with this bon sauvage is scientism or realism, which is the the idea that with science we're gonna we're gonna create this new world, right? So liberalism says man does not have original sin, and we just have to get rid of all these old restraints and just have freedom. And then realism says yes, and with our freedom we're going to use science and uh, to to and only and only science gives truth. By science I mean strictly empirical, experimental science. That only that is truth, and we're going to use those that truth to build a technology to build a new world. So what? Yeah, that sounds great, right? So, um, so they they want to remake the earth in, into uh, they want to finally they want to complete man's conquest of nature and create an artificial world. Now this theme, one one uh, quote unquote cultural icon of modern American culture is the movie Two Thousand One Space Odyssey. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. But it's a it's a very weird movie. It's made by Stanley Kubrick, who is you can write a whole you can write a whole book about him, uh, so far as this whole nihilistic program is concerned. And the movie shows the movie is really about man uh, man evolving to a new stage, right? But but the the transition to the new stage has to be midwifed by his technology, which becomes smarter than he is. So there's a computer in the movie that there's a spaceship that's going to Jupiter, and there's a computer in the movie, the HAL 9000 that has figured men out and now it's smarter than the men and so the man the men have to the, the he it kills one of the men and the other man has to turn it off so it doesn't end up taking over everything but then the man goes to a moon of jupiter and he meets this monolith that's been put by there by aliens and the and the monolith zaps him and he gets transformed to a gigantic uh, super embryo of the superman that's floating through the universe and we're going to become the new race <laughs> Okay, so it's this, it's this bizarre combination of pseudo-mysticism about man evolving to a new stage with the, the absolute trust or the absolute worship of technology, right? That, that we're going to invent this technology that's going to be our midwife that's going to bring us to this next stage of evolution. So that's the new world that they're creating. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's uh, obviously, I mean, it's obviously uh, is demonic, right? So... Uh, by 1962, we didn't have, you don't have to go to 2001 Space Odyssey and go to monoliths and cosmic embryos. You can just go back to 1962 and read Father Seraphim, and he's, he's, I'm going to quote now on pages 81 and 82, a whole paragraph. It is, of course, no secret to contemporary philosophers and psychologists that man himself is changing in our violent century. How much people have just changed since, say, the year 1900. Under the influence, of course, not only of war and revolution, but of practically everything else that lays claim to being modern and progressive, we have already cited the most striking forms of nihilist vitalism, whose cumulative effect has been to, okay, he's going to say, uh, he's going to have a number of imp important uh, terms here, uproot, disintegrate, and mobilize the individual. So you're uprooted, the French word is déraciné, you're deracinated, that's an English word, deracinate. To deracinate someone is to totally uproot him from his roots. Latin. It's Romanian. from Latin, from Romanian. radix. Romanian. Latin and Romanian is the same word. Yeah, so you uproot the man, you pull him from his roots, then you disintegrate him. In other words, you disintegrate his family life, then you dis disintegrate his mind, so that all of his old concepts are disintegrated. They're pulled apart. And so you can just take the pieces of his mind and put them back together again the way you want. Okay? And then mobilized. Mobilized the individual. Everyone becomes mobile. No one's still anymore. Everybody's moving. They're either literally moving from one place to another, or they're just running around every day in their car, or their minds are always moving, but they're moving, they're all in, always in motion. Part of something. They have to be part of something, right? And they can't rest, they can't be still. They can't be still. Okay? To substitute for his normal stability and rootedness, most people for most of history have been, whatever their problems were, they were rooted and they were stable. They lived in one place, they knew the same people all their lives, they believed the same things all their lives. And they didn't feel the need to be running around constantly active. Um, and uh, one, one, you know, extroversion, extreme extroversion has been now uh, identified as the normal personality, right? So you're only functional if you're, the more extreme extrovert you are, the more functional you're considered to be, right? Because they, they have to make this extreme. And, and America in particular was a laboratory of extroversion. And that's predictable because who came to America? The most extroverted people came to America. So there have been uprooted. uprooted people. So there have been studies, for example, of of families who are separated, and and they stayed. Some families stayed in the British Isles. Others came to America. So there are Smiths 
in Link England and there's Smiths in America, same blood, same DNA. But after a couple of but but, but they noticed that when they studied their personalities, the ones who came to America were all extroverted, right? They were constantly in motion, right? And um, I'm not saying that to attack America, or attack my country. I'm just saying that this is this is part of the this is part of the 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 experiment, right? To make a new kind of person, to bring all these highly extroverted, constantly busy people here, right? Long, long, uh, and then you create a new culture. But then you then through Hollywood and and TV, you export that culture. The rest of the world starts to regard that is normal. That's admirable. You you, you know a, a child in a, a village in Asia somewhere sees an American commercial with kids are on skateboards and they're the scene changes every nanosecond they're on a skateboard they're drinking a coke they're 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 dancing they're, they're in constant constant uproar constant movement and the little kid in the village in india or where says well i guess that's normal that that's that's admirable you see i want to be like that you see or the child in a village in eastern europe says you know uh the way my grandparents live is boring i need to go to the city and go to nightclubs because that's you know you have to be move you have to be in movement you have to constantly be and that's remember that this is an aspect of what we call vitalism remember the second stage of of uh, nihilism vitalism where you, you, you there's no what's important is not truth or meaning what's important is the uh, maximizing your emotions and having thrills and trying to transcend your humdrum daily existence through 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 intense uh, experience there's right. one more is le lifelong learning oh lifelong learning so you, you can never rest <laughs> like, like, like. Well, you know, if you're in, you're in IT, right? Uh, you have to keep getting new certifications constantly, constantly, constantly being forced. And I get, uh, I get frustrated with this. Of course, I'm not a, I'm not a techie person. And then I, every time, every time I get an update in my computer and I have to learn some new thing, I go, ah, so. So important. I, 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 told him, I said they're messing with our minds because there's no reason the old system worked just fine. Why are they doing this? Right. Yeah. So, so constant. Constant change, constant change, money. constant yeah. change. Yeah. When I, I remember being in in, uh, in college, uh, well, next year will be my 40th anniversary of my graduation. So, you know, over over, you know, around 40 years ago, in college, and taking a, a course on modern religious philosophy, and there was a whole article on Promethe or not Prometheus, Protean man. Proteus was the god in Greek mythology that constantly changed form. So this religious philosopher was saying, the religious philosopher was saying, uh, we have to have a new religion. Because people don't say the same anymore. We have to have a religion that matches protean man. Because mm -hmm. every people are changing their personalities, they're changing their interests, they're changing the way they dress every couple of years. Right? They're constantly changing. See. So what this says, of course, we know that even common sense would tell you that this creates uh, a kind of a schizophrenia or a disintegration of the personality. Right? So this whole mobilizing, the idea of mobilizing the individual. To substitute for his normal, this is the author's words, uh, Eugene Rose's words, to substitute for his normal stability and rootedness a senseless quest for power and movement. Like the, the boys are addicted to video games, right? Power, it's, it's, it's vicarious power, they're not really shooting the monster or whatever, but it's, it's move, constant movement and a sense of power. And to replace normal human feeling by what? A nervous excitability. He was very astute, he was just watching the people around him back in, in San Francisco back in 62. A nervous excitability. We're always excited about something, right? Nervous. Something, something big is about to happen. I've got to be, something new is about to happen. I've got to be excited about it. And of course now, back in 1962, they didn't have 24-hour news or the internet. They just had a news program, you know, they had the 6 o'clock news and 10 o'clock news and the newspapers. But now we have 24-hour news. So they, they create some kind of insane drama like this Brett Kavanaugh nomination or something like that. Or some insane drama about uh, uh, Trump and Russia or some you know, all these stupid things they create all this theater and this drama and they get everybody on two sides watching it 24 hours a day worried that their man's gonna lose that their sides going to be destroyed and, and they're they're just obsessed with this and they're glued to these screens and, and they're obsessed with these these constant so that you could you're never allowed to rest you see Mm -hmm. Oh, Las they Vegas. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yes. Nervous. Well, casinos are demonic. They, oh, I told one machine. Casinos are. I just said. Uh, they have them everywhere. So. No, one of my, one of our, one of our Orthodox brothers. He was at my house the other night, and uh, we were getting ready for bed. Uh, he was staying over uh, to pr pray and get ready for communion and so forth. And uh, he got a call. Uh, Eleven o'clock at night. That's my cousin. My cousin's wife. They're at the casino, and she lost him. She can't find him. Well, and she was upside down. She, she couldn't think straight. Why? Because they walked in there, 
and the demons just grab you and 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 she couldn't even she, finally she found him right mm -hmm. but it was but she was in a tizzy she was she was just upside down it's a terrible place. yeah it's a terrible place you go in there are no windows and no clocks Sick people with oxygen. you don't know if it, you don't you don't know if it's you don't know if it's day or night you don't know what day it is what time it is and you're in this it's really hell. I, I've only been in the casino once or twice, and when I walked there, I said, well, this is like a preview of hell. This yeah. is really... When we had to go through, because yeah. they put oh, yeah. them, so you are attractive to play. Yeah. You have we to had go to go through. We've seen, oh, wow, this yeah. is... Yeah, it's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely diabolical, right. But, it, but you make life a casino, you see. You don't have to go to the casino. You can just be looking at the news or whatever, and you're worried about fortuna, about luck, you know, not going, going against you. You see, something bad is about to happen. Always, something bad is always about to happen. You see? No, it didn't. We you were see. just... Exactly. We're just fine. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't happen and we're fine. But, but, but you have to realize, you have to realize, you have to step, be able to step back from it, not get trapped by it. You see? So this new man is rootless. He's discontinuous with the past. He has no past and no future. We've talked about this before. So he's the raw material of a, uh, what, so that a demagogue or an oligarchy or a, an elite can mold him, right? He's just raw material, right? He's a, he thinks he's a free thinker. He thinks he's a skeptic, that he's hard, he's hard nosed. He only wants to know the truth, right? He, only, he doesn't want all that religion and stuff. He just wants to know the facts. He's closed only to the truth, but he's open to every new fashion, right? If the new book comes out, he's open to that. Oh, that's, he's going to talk about that, you know, and, and uh, if you don't go along with it, well, what's wrong with you? You know, but then next year, he'll have forgotten that, that book or that show, and he's on to a new, opposite. a new thing. Maybe the opposite. Yes, who knows? He doesn't even know it's the opposite. Because right. you know, when you stop believing in the true God, you'll believe anything. Right? He has no foundation. He he's proud of being a seeker after some new revelation, ready to believe anything new. I'm open-minded. You know, um, G.K. Chesterton once said, "An open mind is like an open mouth. If you leave it open too long, it collects flies." <laughs> <laughs> um, so, he, and also, modern men want to see themselves as planners and experimenters. We're experimenting with new forms and. Uh, and he worships facts because he's abandoned the truth. The world is this vast laboratory in, in which man is to free to determine what's possible. Right? We always, we're always experimenting. We're pushing the edge of the envelope. We're finding out what's, what new thing is possible. And uh, Father Seraphim goes through, in pages 83 to 85, he talks a lot about the new art, that this new man is captured visually in the new art. Look at 20th century art, the way they depict people. It's absolutely horrible. It's horrifying. Right? It goes from the grotesque to the absolutely unrecognizable it's just lines and dots and stuff but it, it's all very grotesque or if you look at uh, of course now we have all this um, science fiction and fantasy movies and so forth and they're always showing these new for aliens right which are all just horribly deformed human beings or deformed animals so they can't create anything new they can just deform just have just demonically deform what God created right. so the new art if you if you want to um, if you want to see the the nihilist program Visually, just go to the the new wing of the National Gallery in Washington, which is the modern art wing of the National Gallery, or go to the Guggenheim in New York, and um, or just the modern art exhibit here in Denver. At our big, we have a big art museum here, the Detroit. DIA, Detroit. and uh, here in Detroit, yeah, and um, and you you see the modern art shows you their mindset depicted visually, which is chaos. It's it's a uh, it's uh, aggressive, right? It's it's uh, it's there to shatter your ideas of normalcy and reality and it's also there to to it's also there to they intend to um, fool you or to humiliate you by getting you to say that it's good or that it's it's getting you to admire it when they know it's really stupid and if they can get you to admire it then you've degraded yourself because it's fashionable it's fashionable You're yeah open. yeah oh yes that's so uh, you know it's got so much creativity or it's 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 so uh, provocative or whatever they make up some kind of nonsense with a dot, yes, well. yes. Or in music, there's a so-called composer named John Cage, and one of his compositions was something like uh, Five Minutes of Silence or something like that, where he came out on the stage, people would pay money, he'd come out on stage, sit at the piano, and not play anything, then walk off, and they'd go, hey! You know, or sometimes he'd, he composed music that would say, uh, the pianist must drag chains across the strings. So he'd come out on the stage with a beautiful concert grand piano, and then get chains go, brung, brung. But um, and everybody go, hey, all right, that's genius. He's he's amazing. You know, he's a genius. And um, <laughs> so this is, and and they're humiliating. What they, what they they're humiliating the elites. I mean, these are all the most educated, the wealthiest people, the most cultured people, right? 
So they're humiliating the elites. They'll create monsters, their children. Yeah, and, and their children will, the children of the elites will become uh, messed up. Right. So uh, he goes into the, he doesn't talk about music. I I love music and I think I think more about music than I do about visual art. But obviously, Father Seraphim repeatedly in the book, in the main place, he talks about art, visual art, and all his notes and the lectures we've been studying. So obviously, he was someone who loved art and cared about and felt the power of visual art. But I was, but we could also uh, music is more powerful. I think music. I think uh, my personal opinion is that music is more powerful. Yeah. Really yeah. Now chapter five is beyond nihilism. So beyond mere destruction, we, the nihilists have to have a program to go beyond nihilism, to build something, and to create their new age. So the author is writing 1962. It's only 17 years after World War II. Kind of like 9-11, yeah. The early, the early 60s is like things were about to happen. And the, there, there are several 9-11 moments in American history. The big 9-11 moment in my childhood was the assassination of John Kennedy. The assassination of John Kennedy was, uh, it was a, a, a public drama an orchestrated, staged initiation into terror, into 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 uh, fear, and it, it was actually it was like it was a an, really an occult sacrifice enacted on this giant public stage, because for the first time tens of millions of Americans were watching public events on television. Okay? So the first thing, the first act in this drama was this ritual murder of John Kennedy uh, by various. But there's a whole there's a gigantic literature on the Kennedy assassination, but it's. In, Which was predicted one year before. The Manchurian candidate predicted the whole. Yes, so they were they were they were getting ready for this whole thing, and they did it. Uh, we don't need to go into who, exactly who they are, but we can say that we can say that it was a it was a planned uh, occult sacrifice, right? And then and then they traumatized everybody. I, mean, I remember being a little kid. I was in first grade. I can remember. Everybody remembers it. Every American kid remembers it. You know? Yeah, I was in. I was in sixth grade. It was it was in the morning. I was in such a Leocadia's class at St. Catherine of Siena School on Bonneville Boulevard in Metairie, Louisiana, on November twenty second, nineteen sixty three. And I remember her saying, "The president's been shot. Get on your knees. And we're going to pray the rosary." And then I remember singing home with my dad and uh, and watching. And mom, mom and dad, dad stayed home from work and or or, or well, he was actually he was at home during the day. So he worked at night, and we were watching this whole ritual on television. Of, uh, over and over, showing over and over and over again all the images of the funeral and everything, and so this was a uh, this is a demonic initiation into this new age. Where they were they were now Kennedy. Why did they have to sacrifice? Kennedy was the prophet of this new idealistic age. Father, in the beginning of chapter five, Father Seraphim talks about well, there is the fact that well, there there are these now on the ashes of this all this destruction. Now we see there is a new idealistic young idealistic generation. They want to make things better, right? These are the people uh, that that um, thought John Kennedy was going to in institute a new, beautiful. Uh, they call it Camelot, you know, a new we're gonna, from from the play, you know, the, a new beautiful utopia of peace, progress, prosperity, freedom from communism, and so forth and so on. And um, so the, his speech became engraved. His inauguration speech became engraved in the minds of all these young idealists. Right. Ask not what you, your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. God's work on earth must truly be our own. And, um, and so God's work on earth must truly be our own. So we're going to create, we're going to, right, building this new um, progressive America, we're doing God's work. See, then they sacrificed him. <laughs> they, they killed him. Oh, did he have a different speech before? Oh, that's, that's yeah. My view. Yes. Oh, you're talking about the, um, yeah. the, 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 the video, the, the, the speech where he said that about the secret societies. Yes. Well, that's also an important, yeah, that's also an important thing. But he, obviously he had to go. But then they continued this traumatization by, by televising the Vietnam War. They create the Vietnam War and they televise it in great detail. So the first time in history, people are watching their sons getting killed on television in, in jungles right across the world. So it's, and our soldiers were totally traumatized because they had no idea why they were there. And they were drugged. They were experimenting on them, and they were they were selling them drugs, giving them drugs. Um, and so there were so many so many terrible things happening at that time. And then at home, there's this cultural revolution where all there's America up to that point had been a relatively stable, church going, family oriented country. And then in the 60s, everything got turned upside down by drugs, the sexual revolution, and rock music. And um, they they created a, a new anti culture. Almost in a few years, it seemed. It seemed like it only took a few years, from say sixty, sixty-five to seventy-two or seventy-three, and psh, everything had changed. You see, so um, this. But Father Seraphim points out that these these an idealist 
who only believes in this world can never create anything stable or, or holy or, or truly beneficial because they just believe in this world. So it's always going to end up being some kind of destructive and deformative result. It's always preceded by uh, horse slaughter of young people. Yes. Yeah, the, 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 the sacrifice of blood, especially of young people and the best young people, because all the best, you know, World War I and World War II destroyed the manhood of Europe. The Vietnam War destroyed thousands and thousands of the best, the most patriotic, the most intelligent, the best American young men. Physically. Physically or mentally. So to this very day, uh, a, a man says, I'm a Vietnam vet. You know what he's talking about. He means he's, he's disturbed, he's psychologically disturbed, right? He never recovered. I mean, of course, there are men who came back and they were so strong that they, it didn't affect them that way. But a, a high percentage of the men, just as, and one thing that is, you know, a lot of the literature in the 1920s is about how World War I destroyed the minds and bodies of European manhood. And um, the, a lot of the, so this, the, that didn't really happen. The Americans were still, came out of the two world, two world wars still very strong. But the 60s really did the men. Um, so this is in pages 88 to 91, uh, we, we, we run into the, the term post-Christian age. So now we're, by the 1960s, when he's writing, we're definitively in the post-Christian age in the West. Of course, in the Orthodox East, it had to be done with violent revolution. In the West, it was done more with uh, propaganda, brainwashing, education, drugs, and so forth. Um, so the prophets of this new age, they're, they're, they're announcing this new age, and the 60s was called the age of Aquarius. There's this... Uh, lewd musical called Hair um, that celebrated the hippie culture and, they, and the theme song was the Age of Aquarius. What was the meaning? Age of Aquarius, supposedly it's some new beautiful utopian age where there will be no constraints and everybody will love each other and, and there will be, be no intolerant religions and no mean governments but everybody will just be happy and smoking dope and having free sex and uh, you know living it up. Um, but the prophets of the New Age, of course, they saw in, that violent revolution was a necessary cleansing. So the, the destructive nihilism was the apocalyptic herald of this new age. But then the revolution moves out of the violent stage to a benevolent one. So that's what's happened kind of in Eastern Europe. What we had, we had violent revolution, right? They had to kill lots and lots of people. The communists had to just kill lots and lots of people, the best people. And, uh, and that was terrible. But then we kind of, kind of got a break from that. But then starting in the 1990s, then the benevolent revolution comes in, right? We're, hello, I'm from America. I've got nice things for you. I've, I've got, uh, you know, all the, 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 the advantages of, of our freedom. So now you can have more pornography and you can have uh, more, you know, rock music and more, you know, so forth and so on. So there's the, the benevolent revolution creating the new earth and the new man. And all the power, he points out that all the power centers today, whether governments, corporations, whatever, they're all revolutionary. There are no traditional governments, right? They're all, in one way or the other, they're all, they're all on this, in this program. They're all, they're all on the, they might be, some are farther along than others, some are more open than others, but they all accept these basic premises. You know, we're making the world a better place. Um, you know, we're, we're, going to, we're going to wipe out poverty through science. You know, we're, we're going to tolerate all ideas, uh, except, of course, the true ideas. But. So whether they call themselves Marxist or socialist or capitalist, they're all reading off the same page. So he talks about the three corollaries of nihilist thought. The new age we've already talked about. The new man, the man-god. You know, Nietzsche, of course, is famous for talking about the superman. And a new kind of society in anarchy, peopled by supermen. So there's going to be this anarchy. The age of Aquarius is this anarchy where there's no government and no church and nobody tells you what to do. You're just, everybody's free and they do what they want because, and everyone's a superman, right? They've, they've, they're, they're all, uh, they've all gone beyond traditional boundaries and they're all just, a new, they're a new thing, they're a, a new race. Okay. Now, uh, of course, this is a spiritual disorder. <laughs> All of this is a spiritual disorder, right? It's demonic, it's a, it's a deformation of the, of the soul. It can only be defeated by Christ. The only answer is Christ and orthodoxy. What lies beyond nihilism is simply more nihilism. They, they talk about creating a new earth and a new man, but they're just creating more more evil and more unhappiness and more destruction because it's all nihilism. Satan cannot create, he can only destroy. Right. So right now, if Father Serapin was writing back in 62, I don't know if he even could imagine what's going on now with this transgenderism, right? They're going to destroy, so this, this is a demonic, a demonic mockery of creation, right? So God creates man and woman, right? And the, the demons say, we can do better than that. We're going to create this non-man, non-woman thing. 
Okay? But of course, oh, it's just a mockery. It's a grotesque, horrible mockery of, of, of humanity. They, they're, they're just destroying these people, and they're destroying little children. The question is, how can you convince things that yes. are Yes, how can, how can you convince a parent to do that to his child, yeah. to destroy his own child, and be proud of it? Wear a t-shirt saying, I'm proud of my transgendered five-year-old. And they're giving them drugs. They're giving them hormonal treatments and mutilating them when they're children. You know, this is utterly unthinkable, right? So it, it can only be explained by the demonic. It can only be explained by the demonic. But then you realize that in the ancient pagan religions, what they do? They practice infant sacrifice. They kill their own children, right? So this, this is nothing new. It's a return. It's a modern, enlightened, scientific version of just the same old stuff. Just the same old stuff. It's, it's, just, it's just Satan, right? Even the Roman. To become what catamites? Oh, to turn to turn some of them into 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 eunuchs. Yeah, I think usually they were slaves. I think not their own children, but they were slaves to turn them. Yeah, to make them effeminate. Yep. Yeah, it's sick. I mean, it's just it's just evil. That's right. And so what they're doing is they can't create anything new. So they can only destroy. So this new man they're creating is this mutilated, um, grotesque non-person, right? Non-human or subhuman. That's just been just been. Um, bent and, and twisted and, and deformed out of out of recognition out of all you know scope of recognition this is their new man they're creating but it, it, even if a person isn't a transgender or he isn't mutilated with 5,000 piercings and tattoos and everything they, they're just mutilating the mind now through electronic addiction you know at the, writing back in 62 father seraphim could say yeah people watch tv too much they go too many movies but now when you have a child who's six years old already addicted to an iphone or th yeah, people get three-year-olds. Who? Their husbands. Yes. Well, we, it, they don't it, leave the phone down to the phone Yeah. Moment. Well, I have a complaint about the women drivers who are texting while they're driving. <laughs> well, I've seen uh, others doing their uh, nails and yeah. makeup. Yeah. Well, their nails and makeup—that's old stuff. But now the texting and the the addiction to the that screen, because we we know that we know even the technology is physiologically addicting. It activates pleasure centers in the brain. So they've created this technology that, that just the, even if the content's totally good, even if even if uh, I'm an Orthodox person looking for a good sermon or a chant on YouTube or whatever, that click and getting that that visual image uh, that's satisfying. You see, so it's psychologically and physiologically addicting. So what are we going to do about it? I mean, we're having in our conference, our youth conference next week in Toronto. Father, Father Padaskeva, one of our deacons, is going to give a whole lecture. He's going to give lectures to every age group, and he, he says you've got to become disconnected. You you've got to. He's, we made up, but we've made up a shirt for the conference with the phrase "disconnected" on the sleeve. So you've got just to get the kids to say, "This is cool." To be disconnected is cool. You've got to convince them it's cool. So being disconnected, at least okay. so many hours a day. Hey, you're disconnected. You're okay. You're off. You're off Facebook. You're off social media. Okay, okay. You're not tweeting. Just, yeah. You're cool. It's still normal. Yeah. It'll be normal. You're more normal. You're more cool. Yeah. You see, that's what we. And so, of course, we all, all of us in our professions, we need these machines now for our work. If I stopped sending out these recordings, right? If I stopped responding to people who email me, they'd be very crushed, I mean, because they, they depend on, on, you know, to learn something or to be counseled about something or to answer a question about something. It'd be very risky for me to say, nope, I'm off electronics altogether, I'm just going to write you letters. I'm going to get a typewriter and write letters. I mean, I'd love, I, every day I, I, I fantasize about doing that, just getting a typewriter, buying an old-fashioned typewriter and just because my handwriting is terrible. So just typing, I thought, you know, if I could just get off all this, all this stuff, yeah, you know, send out all my send, send out all the stuff I've done so far, and just send it all out to everybody, and then close this thing, this this laptop forever, and then just every day of the year, the rest of my life, to write a, an actual letter to somebody. So in one year, I've written 365 actual letters to someone, to 365 different people, with my typewriter, and sign it with my sign it with a fountain pen with my name, and uh, that's something they could hang on to, like when they, they could show their grandchildren and say, "See, people used to write letters." <laughs> um. Anyway, that's a, I guess that's maybe that's a, a fantasy, but um, pardon me, it's pretty much a fantasy. But um, but at least uh, but at least there have to be hours of the day. Or say on Sunday, part of Sunday should be we no electronics on Sunday. We go to church, we come home, we pray, we visit an elderly person in the hospital, we take a walk, we make a nice dinner for the family, we talk, uh, we look at old photographs from childhood, something, just anything, but not be on the computer on Sunday or not on the iPhone. Turn off the iPhone. And uh, now I'm a priest, so somebody might be in the hospital. So I say, well, I have my phone on. If you're gonna call me, call my phone, and uh, but don't email me on Sunday, or don't don't look at, don't expect me to answer your Facebook message or whatever.
but there has to be something. We have to take measures. We have to do something. Because getting back to our subject, creating this new man, they're doing it now with this electron. They're creating this new humanity where the people, uh, they, don't have, uh, they don't have attention span. Uh, they no longer want to read carefully. They just want to skim things, right? And uh, they don't like books anymore. They don't want to read books. In general? Yeah. No, they don't like it. They, they, they can't they can't the brain, process it right. The so they're they're and and they're shifting from shift. They've shifted everyone from um, a rational or or a linguistically oriented way of processing information to a visual way of processing information. And with a visual way, the visual way you can it, it's much less definite, right? So the dogmas of the church, you have to be able to read and understand concepts linguistically through words, uh, not not images. Right to to understand the theology of the church, right? Um, and I mean, they're, they're, of course, theoretically, there 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 could be peasants, right, who live in a completely idyllic, beautiful agrarian world where they where they they just go to the church and they see the icons on the walls and they just believe and they just hear the preaching in church they just believe. But we don't live in that world anymore, right? Um, we live in a world where we're getting constant constant input from a thousand different uh, sources, and we have to be able to fight back with words. We have to be able to think logically, we have to think rationally. And you think rationally with words, but they reprogram people so that they're, they, they're only capable of being excited or uh, being stimulated by visual images. And so they, they can be very easily manipulated. Um, I, or, speaking of Facebook, you know, um, I don't like it, but I, you know, I was convinced a few years ago to, that I would reach more people. So I just, I don't post personal stuff. I just post my, what I write or our recordings on there. But I'll notice, and usually I put an icon, an image of an icon with, a, with an, an article. But I'll notice that when I just post just a picture, some nice picture, there'll be like hundreds of likes, right? But if it's a, an article, there might be five or six. <laughs> so to be more interested in pictures of, of uh, some cute thing going on, right, than, 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 than reading an article. So they are creating, beyond Father Seraphim's imagination, I'm sure, when he, writing back in 62, they are creating this new humanity he's talking about, right? Um, so, so the nihilist dream of a new age, uh, well, let me go back to point two under D. Nothing positive can come from a dialectic with nihilism. Uh, what, what happened was, um, I remember this, being in seminary in the 70s and reading a lot of junk written in the 60s, is that all the, the advanced thinkers were saying, well, you know, yeah, nihilism's, all these theologians were saying, yeah, nihilism is bad, but we have to dialogue with it because it represents a healthy reaction to blah, 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 right? So, oh, okay, so we'll dialogue with them. So you end up dialogue with it, and you end up just going down with them, right? You don't go into a dialectic with, with evil, right? You don't talk to the devil, right? You just stay away from him. There, there can be no dialectic with nihilism. So the question is now that they're in the process of creating this new man, how do we respond? Well, you don't dialogue with it. You just call it out for what it is. You denounce it. You denounce it. And uh, you don't dialogue with it. You denounce it. Um, so the nihilist dream of a new age has gone from being the hallucination of the few, and that's point three, pages 95 to 96. The nihilist dream of this new age they're creating has gone from being the hallucination of the few, like in the 19th century, right, to the worldview of the masses, like the masses are convinced now. After all the trauma of the 20th century, right, they had to kill millions and millions of people, destroy Christian Europe, two gigantic uh, suicidal world wars, Everybody's just pounded and traumatized, and uh, now they've accepted. Oh yeah, I guess we need, we didn't we need a new age now. So by the, by the 60s, when he's writing, now the masses have accepted what prior to 1900 was just the idea of a few elites. Okay? That's why you're 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 telling me your experience, or your friends are saying, oh yeah, there's nothing wrong with homosexuality. Right? No, it's about they uh, want just love. Love and acceptance. Yeah. So these are just ideas that are just in the air. And then they take your children. Uh, yeah. Then they come in for your, then they come for your children. But I told you just now, you know, one, one person told me, yeah, I don't like homosexuality, but if my child becomes homosexual, uh, what can you do? That's fine. Still love. Yeah. So that they've just given up, right? Um, or also... When so this, this, these nihilistic concepts have become the property of the masses. They just, they're almost unconscious now. You talk, you talk to people and say, hey, you know, they try to destroy your child. Right? Yeah, they're destroying your child. But the answer of the parents is, we are going to do whatever we can. Yeah. I mean, not stop it. No. Not, we're not going to, well, again, that's, see, there's no militancy. That's another thing. They've destroyed, they've destroyed the concept of milit Christian militancy. If you're militant, you're intransigent, they say, well, you're a, you're a zealot, you're a fanatic, you're a kook, you've got to be more loving, you've got to be more sensitive, 
Uh, yeah. So, um, so Father Seraphim ends the book by talking about hell, which is very appropriate. <laughs> well, before the, before he talks about hell, he talks about this idea of Christians as being nihilists, but it's in a in a facetious way. We're 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 nihilists in the sense that we say this world is nothing. The next world is what's real. Um, so um, we're we're nihilistic towards the nihilist vision of reality. But that's kind of a kind of a footnote in a way. I mean, it's not a footnote in the book, but it's kind of a a little excursus, a little um, sideline. But he ends with uh, very strong uh, paragraphs about hell. The Christian believes in hell and knows how to escape it. We believe in hell. We know it's there, and we know how not to go there through Christ, through, our, through the faith, through the church. Okay. The nihilist also know hell, knows hell exists, but they want to deny the existence of hell, and they want to create their heaven on earth. But of course, what they do is they make hell on earth, and they prepare people to go to the, to the, to the eternal hell. The final word of nihilism is this. There is no annihilation. They cannot annihilate everything. Right? Nothing of what God created has ever will be destroyed. Man must live forever, either in eternal joy or eternal torment. Can't escape the, the, the souls in hell wish they could die because they can't die. They're going to exist forever in torment. And um, so there is no annihilation. God is going to win. God's already won through the resurrection. And um, the question is what side we're going to be on. So the point of our course really has been to recognize all these false ideas and to recognize them when we hear them and also to realize that this, these aren't just ideas. These are, these are animated by a demonic spirit. And we have to take refuge in the church. We have to, this, this, knowing, seeing, the, seeing the, what's going on in the world around us and also knowing all these things from our study of this history of ideas and this history of this degeneration of, of the Christian people that should spur us on to want to go to church more, right? To confess more often, to receive Holy Communion, to pray, not to skip our prayers, to bless our house with holy water, to, to incense our house, do everything we can to keep away demonic influence, to be very careful about the books we bring in our house, to be very, very careful about the programs we allow people to watch, or the websites we look at. We have to be so vigilant. And one good thing our bishop, Metron Demetrius, has done the past year or two is, is to really emphasize the concept of vigilance, you have to be vigilant, be spiritually vigilant, not, not walk through life, not, not sleepwalk through life, just wanting to enjoy yourself or wanting to just not have to think about things. We can't. Nobody can do that. You, know, you have to be vigilant. Now, our ancestors had to be vigilant because um, their house could burn down easily, or uh, the donkey could kick you, kick you in the face and you could die, or the harvest might fail. The Turks are coming. Or the Turks are coming to the village next year and they're going to kill everybody and carry off all the women and children. Um, so... Whether you're, you live in that kind of a society or our kind of a society, you still have to be vigilant. Life is about struggle and fighting. It's not about just lying back and, you know, just relaxing. And what they've, they've convinced everyone that, that you just need to just uh, enjoy yourself and fulfill your, quote, unquote, fulfillment. And, um, you know, no struggle, no conflict, no effort. And so that's death to the soul. Be nice. Yeah, just be nice. Uh, yeah, just be nice to everyone and get along with everyone and everything's fine. And, uh, but that's, that's really, that's death. I mean, the, when they say go with the flow, well, only dead objects go with, go with the current. Uh, I mean, uh, living, or I should say only living, only something alive can go against the current. You know, dead things flow with the current. Living things can swim against the current. So we, we have to be alive. So um, this really brings an end to Father Seraphim's whole exploration of, of the roots of the, uh, or the, the entire scope of the fall of the West from the High Middle Ages to the 20th century. And um, it's an appropriate place now to put a little, uh, take a little break. And uh, we're going to take an actual break in that I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I'll be back. We'll resume on a Sunday, October 28th. And on October 26th, we're going to start doing catechism for the children on Friday evenings. So we're going to move the adult class to Sunday evening. We're going to have Vespers, and then we're going to have class on Sunday evenings. And then maybe some other people will be able to come on Sunday evenings. I don't know who don't want to come on Friday. I hope so. So we'll resume on, on October 28th, Sunday, October 28th. Um, I haven't decided the time, 5.30 or 6, so I'll, I'll announce it. Um, and um, and we'll, um, I think we need to take a break from setting all these dreadful things. And we're, we need to do at least a mini course on spiritual life. we we'll talk about prayer and the passions and spiritual life. Because we have to get, we, okay, now we know all these all these bad things, but we have to know how to fight it. And uh, um, 
I think the just by recognizing all these bad movements, these bad ideas, bad ideologies, and the demonic spirit, we've already been given some tools to fight it by just being able to recognize things. But we, we really have to work on our spiritual lives because without that, we're going to get we're, we're going to get lost. We don't have the strength. You can we can know uh, what's wrong, but not be able not have the strength to fight it. We can know our faith. We can have studied our catechism, know our faith, but not have inner spiritual strength to keep insisting. No, this is true. This is true. This is true unless we're really leading a life of prayer, unless we're uh, really dealing with our own passions and sins. So uh, after, we, after our break, we'll come back on October 28th, and we'll do a, um, at least a, a few weeks or a couple of months on spiritual life. Then we may come back and do a part two of survival course talking about more 20th and 21st century um, problems. But um, I have to think about that. <laughs> not sure how much more I can take <laughs> of talking about this stuff. <laughs> I need to take a break for a while. Okay, so glory to God for all things.